All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm Amberly Forrester, the flow coach, as it says on social media. Um, I am the founder and principal of Quartz Wellness Collective, and I am usually joined by my counterpart, Michelle Brown, but she will not be able to join us today. She has a scheduling conflict. So I am leading this one today and holding my girl down um, as we hold each other down. It's really important to have that tribe, right? It's like a parent tribe as well. Um, so speaking of parenting, we are talking about positive parenting today and what that all means. So I'm going to ask if anyone is able to turn your cameras on, please turn them on. I love to have the interaction with you and it would be wonderful to see your faces and not just talk to myself. This is an interactive one. So I'm actually going to be asking you questions and not just presenting and talking at you, but talking with you because this parenting thing is it's tough, right? Like in the, in the description I have that it may be the most challenging but most rewarding job that we have. And so we want to get that right. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. And I'm going to share some tips with you that are uh, proven tips and advice from positive parenting and all my positive psychology stuff. And we're just going to have some discussion because no one of us has all the answers. But together, together we'll help each other to be the best moms I'll say that we can be because I don't see any dads on but hopefully we'll have a few folks joining us uh, as we get in to this so I'm going to share my screen with you and get started All right, so as I mentioned every week, just know that we do share these on Facebook and we share them on YouTube. Uh, and so please just be mindful if you're on camera of anything that's in your background or in your foreground, uh, because we will be sharing this. So by you attending, you're giving us permission to share your likelihood in our recording of this. So welcome, it's all good folks that watch our stuff. Like you don't really catch creepsters who are watching positive parenting videos. So I don't think we have anything to worry about, so. All right, um, I am gonna go on and start the presentation. If there are any questions that come up, feel free to use the chat or um, just unmute yourself and, uh, and let me know and we can have questions and discussions in between. All right, so today, again, we're talking about positive parenting. We're gonna talk about strategies to improve our communication with our kids. Communication is so important, it's so key. We're gonna talk about how to motivate our kids to succeed, effective discipline tactics, and at the end, we'll talk about what children need most. So I'm gonna kind of save that for you and not really give you a lot of detail there. But who remembers this? when they were a kid, that infamous answer that parents give all the time of, because I said so. I'm sure I am not the only one that got that. Is there anyone else that experienced the because I said so when they were kids? And they asked their parents over and over again, but why, but why? And the parent just gets frustrated. And at the point it's like, because I said so, and that's why. So I'm getting a yup, a yes, yes. Right? Yeah. So we all experience that. Um, yet in this day and age, our children are more exposed to information than ever before. And so where because I said so may have been the end of the conversation, we're leaving the space for our children to go somewhere else and get the answer. And if we don't tell our kids who they are and what they should do, then someone else will, right? And so we run that risk nowadays that our parents didn't really experience so much when we were younger because I said so and go sit down in the corner and have a seat was it. And that's where the conversation started. But it is just not that easy anymore. Holla says, yes, I used that last night, right? I mean, because sometimes it is gonna be a because I said so, because it is, it is you know, it's, it's not a, all versus nothing type of thing, but sometimes that is the right answer to give to our kids, right? But we're going to just talk a bit about um, a few other solutions uh, in the communications portion of this, so stay tuned. All right, so positive parenting and what is it? So ultimately, positive parenting is the continual relationship of a parent and child or children that includes caring, teaching, leading, communicating, and providing for the needs of a child consistently and unconditionally, right? Okay, so that is positive parenting because there's parenting. Parenting is I gave you food, I give you shelter, now go sit in the corner and you're good, right? And like a lot of us um, knew that when we were growing up, there was this 
belief of, I'm going to skip ahead, but children should be seen and not heard, right? Um, yeah, as we evolve as human beings and as we evolve in our culture, our children are evolving as well. And so the ways that our parents parented us may not work. Those same tactics and strategies and that same approach, that style may not work for our children. Children are experiencing a lot now, like as if parenting weren't hard enough. Now we're parenting in a pandemic like a moment of silence for all of us, right? Because like, as if it weren't challenging enough, we are now having to manage our own emotions, manage ourselves and to manage our children. And so that can be quite challenging. Um, we are having our children dealing with more stress and anxiety than they ever have before. And so the reason that Michelle and I decided to do this workshop today is just to give a bit of support and to provide also the space for us to have a discussion around what our struggles are. So I really do hope that you'll, you guys will chime in uh, and have a little bit of discussion with me uh, so that I'm not just talking to you. Um, so, all right, parenting doesn't come with a manual, right? But it seems like it should because it's like, it's like if there was a one size fit all solution for like the situations in parenting, then give them to us. So some of the things that I'm going to suggest uh, may or may not work. I want your, your feedback on it, but they are things that research and studies have shown to work. And I wanted to share them with you because I find it quite interesting that uh, these things aren't shared more, especially in communities of color. So, uh, positive parenting, it really helps children to develop autonomy by using effective communication and rewarding and encouraging positive behaviors. So that's a part of the goal. That's a part of the goal of what we'll be talking about today. Um, it's not, positive parenting is not like a vague concept of being nice to our children when they don't deserve it. It's a parenting philosophy and a strategic method that's based on the idea that our relationship with our children is the most important thing and that we can help our children develop self-discipline, manage themselves, um, self-control, and really allowing our children to be who they are without us telling them this is how you should do this and you should do that and judging them because that can really result in a lot of insecurities, behavioral issues. So we're going to get into talking about the parenting styles and how those styles affect our children and what some of the results are that they have. So the four major parenting styles are permissive, authoritative, uninvolved, and authoritarian. Is anyone familiar with this? You can use the chat and let me know or just kind of give me a head nod. I'm going to go over them. I don't see you as much to give me a head nod, but I am going to go over these parenting styles in a little more detail. But as you can see from this chart, we have uh, a couple of examples. So let's start with permissive. A permissive parent is that parent that's like, kids will be kids, and they don't really enforce the rules and don't give out consequences often. Like the kid is doing something or they did something, and it's just like, you know what, I am way too wrapped up in everything that's going on in my life, or I received a lot of discipline when I was a child and I just want to let my kid be free. There are different reasons for our parenting styles, but the permissive parent is the parent that usually um, takes on more of a friend role than a parent role. Hold on, I've got to let a couple more people in. All right, that parent that takes on the friend mode and not the parent mode. So I, I want to say also, when I'm going through these, these styles of parenting, some styles, some of us may have some of one style and some of another style. So you may see yourself in these, in this parenting styles in different ways. You may be a, a little of one and a little of other. We're not all one or the other. Um, so just take note because I'm going to do a little quiz and actually ask you to define what your parenting style is. Um, so the permissive parent, often permissive parenting results in children who are more indulgent um, and they often don't do as well in school because there are lower expectations of them. A lot of times permissive parenting results in behavioral problems and there's even a higher risk for health problems with permissive parenting because kids are developing bad habits and they're not being reared to develop better habits. So a lot of times they're struggling academically or they're eating the wrong things and their parents are just like, okay, you know, you can do that, that's fine. All right, so that is permissive parenting. And then we have uninvolved parenting, which is actually associated with neglect. I'm sure there are no completely uninvolved parents on here, but we all have our own lives, right? We are all uh, experiencing 
our own struggles and trying to manage our children. So the uninvolved children is the child that is rarely asking their child questions, like who are you hanging out with? What's going on in school? It's the parent that's not spending a lot of time with their child and doesn't really know um, as much about the child's um, personal uh, interest and personality uh, because they're so busy focusing on other things that they're uninvolved. A lot of times permissive or uninvolved parents are the parents that are expecting kids to raise themselves. Um, it may be somewhat neglectful, but it's, not, it's often not intentional. However, uh, neglect, uninvolved parenting can result in substance abuse. It can result in self-esteem issues and low levels of happiness. The kid is not feeling as important because the, ch the parent's actions and relationship with the child says you're not as important as the these other things that are going on so unfortunately the uninvolved uh uh parenting can have a lot of the same issues the child can have a lot of the same issues as neglected children um but on the other end so does over parenting right because when you're a helicopter parent which we'll get into in a second you kind of you have you're on the other end of the spectrum so what we're trying to do is establish some balance here so let's talk about the authoritarian and then the authoritative parenting so the authoritarian parent is the because i said so that is the parent that is the that's the old school parent really like a lot of us were probably raised by an authoritarian parent or our grandparents were authoritarian in some way authoritarian parents focus on obedience and pu punishment over discipline it's like my way or the highway you don't get no say in here you don't pay no bills around here it's that um they're not authoritarian parents are not really taking their children's feelings into consideration um it's that that be seen and not heard style of parenting. And it doesn't really help kids learn how to solve problems or become confident in their own abilities because it's just telling them what to do, right? And so that can result in self-esteem issues as well because they're feeling like their opinions are not valued. A lot of times children of authoritarian parents may rebel or become good liars to avoid punishment. So if you had that, like that parent, like I knew, I went to school with a lot of these like kids that came from authoritarian uh, parenting, especially I went to a uh, Jesuit university, Fordham University in the Bronx. And so you got a lot of kids that came and they lost their minds when they got to school. They were laying on the side of the ground, like, passed out because they drank too much because they overindulged because they never had any freedom at home. Right. And so those um, that the high expectations and the distance and the lack of uh, relationships that they had with their parents a lot of times resulted in these children leaving the home and lashing out and just going overboard because they finally got some freedom. All right, so the last one we're going into is authoritative parenting. And authoritative parenting, I'm gonna cheat and get a little ahead, is a, is a part of what we aim for as parents. Like authoritative parenting has been found to be the healthier parenting uh, style. And so I'm going to take that off for you guys. Sorry about that. And so authoritative parents are the parents who put a lot of effort into creating and maintaining a positive relationship with their children, uh, who actually explain the reason behind your rules of when it's, it's not like, because I said so all the time, it's like, okay, you know what? I am telling you to eat your vegetables because they are healthy and because you want to grow and be a healthy individual as an adult. I want to give you good habits. Like you're explaining to them the reasoning behind the rules. Um, authoritative parents are investing time and energy into preventing behavioral issues before they actually get started. They're using positive discipline strategies to reinforce good behavior like praise and reward systems, which we're going to talk a bit about. But in authoritative parenting, there's a reciprocal respect that's established with children in that it is not you respect me as the parent, but it's actually showing respect to the child and modeling that they should expect respect in their adult lives or expect respect expect respect even in their lives as children in that they have a right to ask questions. They have a right to be respected and treated nicely and that it's not, this, they're, they're clear standards and they're clear rules, but it's not just about this is what I say and this is what goes and that's it. So 
I want to ask you guys, I'm going to launch a poll. Here are a couple more parenting styles that I'll talk about, but I would like to, hold on, let me stop my share, ask you what type of parents are you? And a couple of other questions. So I'm going to explain these other ones, but I also want to know if you and your partner have the same parenting style and how much of an influence your parents' parenting style had on you. So if you can start to share these while I go back into sharing my screen and telling you a bit more about the other parenting styles, then that would be great. So main types of parenting styles, we went over those, but then there are also, here are these new parents, these tiger parents, who knows, my kids go to school with, my daughter especially, goes to school with a bunch of tiger parents and uh, I almost, I almost drank the Kool-Aid. I almost became the tiger parent because I was like, oh my God, am I slacking? Like, am I not doing something I'm supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be, you go to private school and you get a tutor and you stay up all night doing your homework? Like, I, I was like, am I doing that? And I'm like, you know what? I know my children. This doesn't feel right for them. Um, but tiger parents are those parents who are known for enforcing those rigorous routines, expecting nothing but the best from their children and prioritizing academic success. Not necessarily a bad thing, just a thing. So this is a no judgment zone. And the uh, poll that we're doing is, um, I, what do you call it, is um, anonymous. So we cannot see who answered what. So be honest. Okay, attachment parents. So this is funny. Um, my husband is a bit of a helicopter slash attachment parent. Like I always said, if he could breastfeed, he would have for like three, four or five years. But attachment parents are the parents who really build the intimacy with their child, the co-sleeping, the baby wearing. They encourage good behavior. Uh, they're quick to respond to the kids' needs. Um, and, they, and that gets a bit into the helicoptering sometimes, but the helicopter parents are the parents who are constantly intervening in their children's lives to prevent failures, who are overlooking their kids' weaknesses and who are hovering closely and rarely um, out of reach for them. They're not allowing their children to solve their own problems. The positive parents are, we all, I'm sure, are positive parents in some way, valuing the daily one-on-one -on -one time with each of our kids, sticking to structured routines and embracing positive discipline in lieu of punishment. Uh, and then the outsourcing parents. Now, this is, I will say this too, this is also me, I need to take this poll myself. Uh, hiring others to train and care for your kids, rely on professionals and strive for perfection. I'm a business owner and busy. So where I cannot be there for my children all the time, which I would never want to be because I really believe in freedom for a child. I do have a second mom, as I call her, our nanny or sitter or whatever you want to call her that is really, really helpful around our household and is someone that I know loves my children dearly and will help to take good care of them when I'm not around. So let's see what you all responded. And if I can invite you, I'm going to stop sharing for a second as well. If I can invite you to someone speak up on your parenting style and just share with me a bit of what um, what your reasoning is around that and what that looks like in real life. We have 88% of us are identifying as authoritative parents, authoritarian 25%. That's because I said so and that's it. I hear you, girl. There's the permissive. Um, we have 25%, no one for neglectful, and we have 13% for positive. All right, so will somebody speak up? Hey, Onika, welcome. <laughs> well, well, I'm eating lunch. Oh, no worries. Do you want to tell us about your parenting style? I will. I will. Hi, ladies. So um, this is cool. I was happy to jump on this during lunch. I took a assessment. It's called a healthy needs assessment for a child right after Leia was born. It was based out of a group in um, in Cali, and they do an assessment from zero, excuse me, from three to five. And essentially, you it's kind of a Mars Briggs assessment, but for children. And it's interesting because the adults fill it out as if like you're responding after your, chi after your child. I opted in for attachment parenting. So I'm the person that nursed till she was three. I did the co-sleeping until last year. Um, I, I did a lot of heavy explaining because I didn't like it because I said so. So kind of looking at the moon, the stars in alignment, I'm a Taurus, my daughter's an Aquarius. I'm an herb sign, she's a water sign. I, I, I prefer the attachment 
to kind of give her that free flowing fluidity based on what I got from the Myers-Briggs assessment and based on our personality types. I realized that I do um, outsource because I can't work in the house with her because she's an only child because I live alone. It doesn't work. It's from eight to, to three and she has a lot to, she feels like empowered to be able to have that space and to be able to either tell me how her day was or wasn't. So I'm a mix between outsourcing because I do drop her off at three o'clock to gym, to Kumon, to gymnastics, to dance, to piano. But I do give her a lot of attention. I said, she was in the bed until last year. I nursed till she was three. I give her a huge voice. We have journals that we share. So that seemed to work for us based on, as I said, Myers-Briggs and our signs. I wanted to share that. That's amazing. So, okay, I also want to ask you how much of an influence your parents' parenting style had on your parenting style. So, full transparency, out of um counseling because of that mm -hmm. best version of myself for my daughter um i didn't like the way my mom said because i said so she get, did my mom worked two jobs she was a nurse practitioner my whole career and it was because i said so because she didn't have time to explain nor did she have a desire to explain and in lieu of ensuring that i was the best version of myself for my daughter i'm not married i wanted to ensure that i got my mental health check and I went through years of therapy to kind of to ground with that. I am the diametric opposition of my parents for that reason. And that causes friction because it is seen as though I do appreciate the way I was raised or there's anything wrong with the way I was raised. I turned out to be fine. I just opt for a more personalized approach of my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I know you have an awesome daughter, so you, clearly you're doing something right. <laughs> um, so is there anyone who has a different parenting style from their partner that wants to speak up and just talk a bit about that? Anybody, anybody. Mocha moms. I'll jump in. Hey, Nee. <laughs> she, you know, we, we talk a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. So Hollis, if anyone I, doesn't know, Hollis, will you introduce yourself first? Because I want everyone to know about Mocha Moms as we're all moms on here. So please take I'm, a I'm Cameron's talk. mom is what I am. My name is Hollis Thomas and I am Cameron's mom. <laughs> that is who I am. But there are a bunch of Mochas on here, including Neek. Um, we are a sisterhood of mothers um, and we support each other through the motherhood journey. And um, so I'm happy that all of, all of the ladies are on here, but I am here to talk about me. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about okay. you. Okay. So, um, I am a authoritative and permissive and I do outsource, but I'm primarily authoritative and permissive. And that has everything to do with very, very similar to me has everything to do with how I was raised, which was kids are meant to be seen and not heard. So with our daughter, um, I want to give her a voice. I want to give her an opportunity to tell me how she feels, why she feels that way, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Um, my husband is a, I believe he's an authoritarian by nature, but he's learning how to be authoritative. Am I saying all these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but he's learning the latter based on me. And what I end up doing is I might even throw a helicopter in there. So what I end up doing is when he's being an authoritarian, I helicopter and I come in to try to save the day in order for her to be able to have that voice. And then I go back into the permissive, well, it's okay, we're friends. So it's like playing um, defense sometimes in the household, which can be, um, which can create friction sometimes within the relationship. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Because what I hear is what so many of so much of research said is that says is that by having two different styles, it actually gives the children balance in a way. And so you are adjusting to the energy that your husband's giving off so that your child is ultimate ultimately Cameron's ultimately getting like the best of both worlds. So yeah, yeah, but it can cause friction, right? Because like, so I'll share my my husband is um is a bit of a helicopter parent and I have to remind him 
stop doing everything for the kids, like let the kids do things for themselves. And it's out of his love and, and compassion and care for the kids that he's like, well, I got him, I'll do this. And, you know, I think his parents were a lot like that as well. And so that's the kind of parenting that he is. But I'm, I grew up as an only child in a single parent home and see how important it is to also let kids learn how to do things on their own, because it does make them more pro confident and give them more problem solving skills, right? So, okay, so I want to let you all know what, what the results, the poll results results were. So 25% of us said that we had the same parenting style as our partner. 38% of us said, no, we don't. And then 38% said, kind of. Um, and then in terms of the influence of our parents' parenting style on us, 25% said no influence at all. 50% said, one, I notice myself sounding and acting like my parents sometimes, which is always funny. And 25% said, I notice and sounding my myself acting like my parents often and the other oh zero percent said my parenting style is just like my parents so very interesting Kimberly I see you um you put yourself on camera which I love hey girl hey do you want to jump in and chime hey. in and say anything before we move on sure sure hey Mocus. um yeah so about that last one with your um whether you see your parents Move the source now. I can't see you guys with the pole in the way. Oh, sorry um, about that. That's um, trying to get it off the screen. Okay. That's the last one. Is your parent, is your spouse similar to your parents? I don't like sound like my mom or anything like that, but I was apprehensive to say not at all because I do think it influences what we do. Um, my upbringing was mom is single mom of two kids, me and my older brother lived in her mom's home, my grandmother, who was authoritarian, okay? And so she was still my mama's mama and also dabbling in, uh, you know, whether I can go to the party that my mom said I could go to because, you know, she's in earshot. So, um, so as I'm listening, I'm listening to what I am and what I think my mom was because she felt as though, you know, her wings had been clipped. So she let us fly kind of deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't a neglectful situation. So I don't feel like I sound like my mom, but I have to think that a lot of it still influences what I do. And, and in terms of the poll, I also uh, like, well, I um, am, it wasn't authoritative. So I, we have a discourse. It's, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm very clear about why I'm saying what I'm saying. And then I also want her feedback because Elle has said things like, mommy, can I tell you something? And I always want her to be able to tell me stuff. So I'm like, sure, sweetheart. And one of these times, you, you know, it took four or five times to get upstairs for, for, for bed. And she says, um, will you stop yelling at me? And I said, sure, honey. But I was like, well, will you listen? I was like, sure, honey. But why do you, you know, why, you know, why are you asking me that? And she's like, because it makes me feel lonely. Like when you yell, when you yell, it makes me feel lonely. And I'm like, come on, little girl, because like I don't think adults identify what the what the feeling behind the thing is. Yeah. So I'm big on that. I'm big on that with her. I, I sent we chosen a school that is raising whole humans and has immediately changed their curriculum to include anti-racism stuff and just being change makers and I want what she's getting at home to mirror what, what I've chosen to send her into every day for the next, she'll be there nine years. Um, so what school is she? Where is she? So uh, I'm not in, I'm not in Bergen. I'm in Essex. She's at Farbrook. It's, it's called Farbrook School in Short Hills, New Jersey. Give it a check out. It's an amazing program. Um, they're called progressive. They call themselves a progressive education. Mm -hmm. so, uh, there's that. I do think my husband and I uh, differ in some ways. I have a very like even keel kind of girl. Um, Hollis and I have shared this over the course of quarantine with all the awesome programs we've had to just be able to share and talk as moms dealing through all this and wives. And, um, but she was very emotional during quarantine in terms of like, we'd go see the neighborhood kids and she wouldn't want to leave them. Like, you know, I haven't seen anybody my age. And so she'd be crying and that kind of stuff. And I felt like, she's been home three months too. She can get that. Like it took her two months to be like, hey mommy, when am I going back to dance? Or when am I going back to class? 
Mm-hmm. And my husband was off that, like, no, like, no, get that together. So I think, yeah, in some ways I will give her her space. I want her to still be big and feel things. I'm not going to say stop crying. I don't, I don't think that that's at all healthy. Um, so in those regards, we differ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your child is experiencing the, the both. Right. But then also clearly the, how old is your child? She's five. Elle is five. Five years old to be able to express herself like that is amazing. That's really good. Pat on the back, mom. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're right. There are a lot of, there are a lot of um, adults that cannot fully express themselves or identify with what their emotions are. So Again, a part of that's as that's a part of uh, what is identified as an as a pro to authoritative parenting, that children are able to better express themselves and be more self assured um, because they were able to express themselves and they were listened to as children or as you know in their childhood. Um, so okay, I'm gonna go back in and share a couple more screens with you. So we'll get into the nitty gritty of why we're here now. Your children are not your children, but they come, they come through you, but they are life itself wanting to express itself. I love this quote by Wayne Dyer because it just talks about how we cannot, um, how we don't take ownership of our children and make them, they're not little mini us is you know like that would be like coming from a place of our ego but they're their own person and we want to help them ideally learn to express themselves and learn to um, be confident in who they are so the uh, improving communication in our kids this cracked me up this children should be seen and not heard because the kids face is like wait what like kids aren't even used to hearing that anymore so i don't even know if we can like say the same things our parents used to say uh so with active uh with communication i want to just touch on active constructive responding is anyone familiar with this you can use the chat and let me know if you are. I'm gonna give like a bit of an overview of what active constructive responding is. So they break down our responses to our children into four different, or to people in general, into four categories. And so it's not just about how we respond to bad news, but also how we respond to just random things that people may say, our children in this case, or to their good news. The way that we celebrate their good news gives them a message of, um, it gives them a message of reinforcement. And so we'll start out with destructive and I'm gonna just give examples of each. So say that you're, you come home from a long day at work and your kid tells you that they got a bad grade on their test, the same test that you told them to study for like over and over again. And so you are cooking in the middle of cooking dinner and you're tired. So it's very tempting to respond in that way of like, what, you know, and just like get upset. And so if you are responding with a destructive, active response, you are just like, whatever, I don't even want to talk about that. I told you to study. You absolutely didn't study. Like, I cannot believe that you got a bad grade on your test. What is wrong with you? So that would be an active, destructive response. Now, an active construct, or I'm sorry, I'm going to do active constructive last because that's the one that we aim for. A destructive passive response is to just completely ignore them. Just give them that eye. You know that. I know we all know that mom eye. That eye of like, I just have nothing to say to you. And then the kid's like, what? What, mom? I, you know, and they go into all of their reasoning. But when you're actually avoiding them or you're ignoring what they're saying and you just you're you're passive and you just act like you just don't care so then there's passive constructive and it's like oh really okay so you got a bad grade Mm, that's interesting and just not really saying much um delayed response low energy quiet and the fourth one is active constructive now enthusiastic support eye contact authentic is what it says here but clearly in a situation where they got a bad grade on their report on their test you're not going to be enthusiastic but there can be an open dialogue there can be communication there where you look at them and stop what you're doing and say okay 
what happened? We clearly talked about studying. You were supposed to study. Why did you get a bad grade? And giving them the opportunity to express themselves. What would you do differently next time? What, what happened is a really powerful way of responding to our children that makes them open up where they feel that they can communicate with us and that we're being a good that, that we're listening to them. We're not just telling them what to do and setting down the, the rules, but we're actually listening to them. Um, so whether your child is telling the same joke for the 10th time or sharing some long winded story, it really helps for us to be good listeners to our children and giving our child positive attention goes a long way in terms of preventing behavior problems. If we respond in certain ways over and over, it's one thing to respond once or twice or here and there, but when we make a habit out of being passive or destructive or actively uh, destructive with our responses to our children, it, it turns into an issue for them in some way. It manifests itself in some way. So anyone want to weigh in on that? Okay, I'm gonna move us along to active listening. So active listening is when we are building trust and establishing a rapport with our kids where we're letting them know that you can tell us the good things and the bad things, that you don't have to keep secrets, that I would be more upset to learn about this from somewhere else or for you to keep it in than if you just told me how you felt. When we actually demonstrate concern and we care about what's going on in our kids' lives, this has a huge positive effect on our children. Um, when we are active listening, we let them know that we hear them. We use verbal affirmations like, okay, I see, I hear you. And then we ask them specific questions about what's going on, not just, um, you know, not just like some surface level response that we give them because we're busy, but like a really specific question that, that makes them think, uh, similar to what Kimberly shared with uh, her daughter, those, uh, you know, why do you feel that way or, um, why, when I do this, do you feel like that? It gives the, the child the time, the opportunity to communicate and express themselves. And that makes them feel that we truly understand what they're saying and we truly understand them. Um, active listening avoids, at, when, we're, when we're active listening, we avoid interrupting at all costs. And we like let our kids just talk and we hear what they have to say. We paraphrase and help them to understand better how they feel. Um, it's at, with our children, parenting is a lot like coaching. So like a lot of you know or don't know that I'm a coach, I'm a life coach and a business coach. And so I use a lot of paraphrasing with my clients to make them feel heard and to help them fully express how they feel or maybe even point out something or bring out uh, something more than what they actually said in their words that I caught behind their story or what they were sharing. But um, waiting to disclose our opinion is key. Uh, with our children, not just giving it to them right up front and right away and stifling their own expression, but waiting to say it a bit later can really go miles with our kids because it lets them feel that they can communicate with us. All right, so I'm going to try to breeze through these other ones because it's 112 and we only go until 130, but I hope you're finding value in this. Uh, motivating our children to succeed. So the main thing with motivating our children to succeed is how we make them look at um, the things that are happening in their life. Are they learning or are they judging? So in positive psychology, which is my area of study, so much breaks down to if we are learning from what we're experiencing or we're judging. If we have a growth mindset and we say we can learn more, we can do more, we can, even though I didn't do so well or even though I failed, I am not a failure. The judging path, the fixed mindset would be I failed, so I'm a failure. And then that results in just a lack of self-belief and um, uh, autonomy and the lack of confidence, looking to blame someone, not being held accountable. These are all things that can happen when we are more judgmental. And so that often makes us not, it makes us lose motivation, right? And so with our children, we're ingraining this in them and this can, this can follow them, unfortunately, throughout their lives and take a lot of breaking. Like there are a lot of us, oh, Onika, I'm glad you were here. Thanks for coming. I think you might have jumped off already, but we love Onika. Um, but a lot of us have to get uh, counseling in our adult years to overcome some of what we dealt with in our childhood years, right? And so a part of parenting and all of the information that we have now is like, not only how, not do, I, how do I not mess them up, but how do I actually position them to thrive? And so when we teach them that they have a choice 
and they can look at life and the things that happen and that they can learn from them, then they have a growth mindset. And if anyone's familiar, familiar with Carol Dweck, she's the leading uh, uh, researcher in growth mindset. She has a great book out. She's a professor. Um, but she talks about the importance of children recognizing that there's room to grow and learn more, not acting like, and even adults too, not just children, but not acting like they know everything, being motivated to be curious. Curiosity is a beautiful thing about children. And sometimes we can stifle our children's curiosity by judging them or, or not really fully responding to them and communicating with them. So we want to encourage them to learn. We want to encourage them to be curious. If something happens, not just saying the other person was wrong, like, you know, and automatically siding with them, but really helping them to take a step back from a conflict and look at what happened, what's useful, and what do you want? Like, what do you want out of this? How did you want that interaction to go? What can you learn from what happened to you? And what do you think, the, how do you think the other person feels? So, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot, how would you respond? And then thinking ultimately what's possible and what are your choices moving forward and what's the best thing to do now? Ultimately, that, that, that learner path motivates the children to continue to grow and to move forward and to know that even if I didn't do something right this time, or even if I did do something right this time, there's still so much more to learn. Um, there's so much more to life. And so very important for our children. Anyone want to weigh in on that, learning or judging? Would you say that you, if you can use the chat or unmute yourself, would you say that you are yourself a learner or a judger? And how do you, how does that in turn affect your parenting? Okay, or we can just listen. Oh, hello, is that Faith? Oh, Shawana. Hi, Hi Shawana. Hey. Oh. Hi. Is someone else on or can't see the, the people? I can't oh. see everyone at once, so, but I see um, you. I was, you got the mic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I was first introduced to the, the, the growth uh, mindset by my oldest son, third, maybe fourth grade teacher, who was a younger teacher. He was a male. So I think he, you know, and, and very young, like maybe he's the second year of teaching. Um, and he, that was his method, methodology. I had never heard of that before. And, um, and I think probably I, you know, we, we heard try, try, try again until you get it right. And when you continuously fail at something, you just don't want to try anymore. You don't understand the possibility of try, try, try again. Eventually you will get it. Because every time you try, you'll learn something new. So um, since learning that, that, uh, that philosophy, that's how I work with my children. You might fail at something. But if something that you want, we'll find another way to do it. And most recently, so this year, their school is instituting a student council. So I'm encouraging both of them to run for student council. I have a third grader and I have a, a ninth grader. And uh, we, ch we chose um, positions that, um, you know, that they weren't interested in. And we, you know, help them write, um, help them solve the application, and helping them write uh, letters to the teachers to request recommendations, et cetera. And the point of it, they may not win. You know, either one of them, and they'll do this every year. But even if if you win, great. Look, you, you, you made a strategy. We 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 followed it, and yeah, this is what this is your reward. You, you actually chose something. Or even if you don't get it, let's discuss feelings of rejection. What does that mean? Yeah. How how is it making you feel? How is it making you feel overall? And how can we try it again next time? What are we going to do differently? And I'm hoping so, you know, based on the two outcomes, I'm just thinking, okay, if they don't win, they'll be upset, but so that's a learning lesson versus if they do win. Look, this is what happens when you plan and, um, and you motivate it and, you know, you, you, know, you, have, you, you set forth a plan for, for a goal to reach and you get it. Um, this is how that feels. And you did it. No one did it for you. Yeah. So you were doing this yourself. I'm just here to help you make sure that your you know, requests are, you know, grammatically correct and make sense. And other than that, I'm not doing anything. This is all yet. Yeah. So that's just how I'm trying to approach everything I do with them. Um, so that even if they do fail, it's not a failure based on, you know, you're not a failure. It's just that this, this particular situation did not work this time. Next time will be different. Yeah. Yeah. And that follows, it's such a simple, yeah. it seems like such a simple distinction, but it really makes a huge difference in their mindset and how they'll approach things in the future. I think that, uh, was it Thomas Edison tried like, 
900 some ways of making the light bulb before he actually came up with the light bulb that worked. And like, yeah. think if Thomas mm-hmm. Edison's parents told him you failed, yeah. oh, well, we might not have light right now. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's really hey, Amber. I'm sorry. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is there, is there a difference um, from your experience and expertise? Is there a difference on how we should be teaching those lessons, male versus female? Shawana uh, has two boys, and I'm just wondering if that's, you know, that's a great way mm-hmm. of leading them, right? They're awesome kids, by the way. But <laughs> if that's a great way to lead them, but maybe like girls, it could be, you know, a different way. Yeah, I think so. I don't have a distinction between like with girls and boys, but ultimately it's breaking down to praising the process and not the result. And that when we're telling them, you know, that it is okay to try hard or, oh, you did it. You're like, okay, great. You did a great job. Well, I really love the way that you studied and you put effort in. Ultimately making them value putting effort in is just been found above anything else to be very valuable for children, especially in this instant society of, I, I want it, I get it right away. Children are less, are less likely to value effort than we were in the past. And so it's really important for us to stress that with our kids and our households. So, so uh, you say praise the process, not the result. Love that. Yeah, yeah, really good. And specific, being specific about uh, another tip in our and keeping them motivated is helping them. So one, helping them to f- spot their strengths, like what um, was just shared. Sorry, I don't have your name on here and I just forgot it. I'm sorry, but what was just shared? Shawana. Yes, Shawana, thank you. What was just shared by Shawana about, um, about the way that she's speaking to her children? helping them to recognize when they don't do something right, what they did do right, or what they are good at gives them more confidence in that, okay, you might not be the best at math, but you're a really good writer, or you may not be, um, you know, and not even, not even really just giving them labels at this point, because there's, it's so early on, but just really, it all comes down to strength spotting and being specific, and, and there's a quote that says, if we don't tell our children who they are, someone else will, that I mentioned earlier, but I really think that that's so important, and that we help our children recognize the good things about themselves, and not just to be hard on them about the things that they don't do or can't do, uh, but leaning into what they are really, really good at and celebrating them for that and being specific and saying it to them, they start to embody it and they start to raise their expectations of themselves because you've helped them identify that this is what they're really good at. And that's... (laughs) So um, I don't think that it matters uh, the sex at all, but that's a good question, Hollis. I'm going to look into that and I'll let you know if I find anything of the studies between boys and girls. So I'm going to share my screen again and take you through just a couple more slides before we end. I lied. It's not a couple, but a few. Um, This one cracked me up. Somebody get me a switch, a big one. Like discipline tactics back in the day used to be get the switch. Not that I got the switch, but like we all, especially from black families have heard. Oh, here, I'm going to mute. Okay. Okay, um, Shawana, I just tried to mute you just so we don't hear your background, but feel free to unmute and jump in when you like. Um, so I'm just going to list out uh, a couple of discipline tactics and just highlight for a bit what's happening in our schools and especially the progressive schools. So I'm guessing that Barbrook may have a restorative justice or restorative discipline approach. Uh, ret- retributive des- justice, which was in that we talk about this criminally, but these are also what they do in our schools. So it's interesting um, how they're treating our children in schools. And so there's a bit of discussion around what that looks like and how we reflect that in our homes. Um, It used to be that the justice was defining crime defined as a violation, whatever they're doing, it's a blame, there's guilt, why did you do it? Um, That produces adversarial relationships. Um, you're looking to punish and prevent kids from doing something. And uh, that was like kind of the traditional way of justice and even discipline in our homes. But so now in newer age uh, disciplining, there's restorative justice, which is happening a lot in our schools where they're looking at 
you're looking at how what someone has done is affecting the whole community, not just that person or not just the other person, but the whole culture and community. So within your home, that can be how is that affecting your home and focusing on solving problems. So you're really asking questions to your child about why they did what they did. And, and then listening, that active listening portion where you have a dialogue and you do actually allow some negotiation between you and your child. Now the spectrum, I always look at things as a spectrum it doesn't have to be black or white there can be some in between so no they can't fully negotiate and set the rules that would not be that would be permissive that would not be you know necessarily the best way to establish um your uh, your authority as a parent um, but that they do take part in and that you do take into consideration their feelings or why they did what they did um the Restorative justice practices uh, have been found to be very effective in schools. And so I had a question for us, although we just don't have a lot of time, but how can we apply this at home? Um, so I'll, I'll cheat and, and ask anyone who wants to chime in to unmute themselves and, and chime in. But we want to set boundaries and not just tell our children what not to do, but tell them what to do. A lot of times we discipline our kids and we say, don't do that. You know, okay, so don't do that. But what should I do instead? Like our, when our children are younger, they don't always know what the answer to that is. And sometimes they don't make the right decision just because they just didn't know what to do. So it really is very helpful when we offer alternatives or suggested alternatives to what they did and give them some direction. Building a connection with our children to gain cooperation in that um, when we talked about our parenting styles, if your style is that you're communicating and you're spending time with your kid, then you know they, they don't want to disappoint you as much and they really value that connection and they're often more cooperative. Avoiding shaming and labeling is very important as well because you know when kids are the bully or they're the bad kid, they start to play into that role. We do it as adults too, but when we label our children unnecessarily or make them you are this kid they start to play into that and we don't allow them as much room to break out of that box which could result in more discipline issues hold them accountable you said you were going to do this and since you didn't i'm going to take away these privileges like this is something that's big in my household privileges i give privileges and take privileges away and you earn privileges but they will be easily taken away and if you annoy me with the privilege i'm more likely to take it away and just use it as a reason because i'm like ah, i didn't really want you to have that privilege anyway Way. So just another tip of um, using privileges and taking away the privileges for holding them accountable for what you've asked them to do. Using positive reinforcement, I noticed that you wash the dishes without me asking you to, you know, not just getting on them and ragging on them about things, but like, wow, you're being really responsible when they do things that um, are positive, just that positive reinforcement gives them pride in what they did and makes it more likely that they're going to do that more often. Um, modeling respect, we talked about the importance of respect and striving for empathy. How do you think you make mommy and daddy feel when you do this? And having actually getting them to start considering how other people feel. How do you think your brother feels when you uh, take his toys away and you're mean to him or when you say those mean things to him and starting to strengthen the relationship between your children? So because their experience is not just you, but it's everything that's happening around them. And so you're, you're raising them to be more empathetic when you show more empathy for them or when you expect for them or raise the dialogue of them having empathy for people around them. And then sometimes it's just picking your battles. Like the, so the parts of me that's the permissive parent is like, okay, fine, go like play with the paint. The mat's down, I don't care. You're making yourself busy. You're keeping yourself entertained. Go do that. And that's fine. Cause we pick our battles, right? And not everything needs to be like, do, do, do this and, and disciplining them. Um, and one of the last ones that I have for you was something that I, is a tip that I found to be really helpful. Single word reminders. I, so I'm a, I'm in positive education. I do positive psychology, but I'm the whole student development, that's my thing. I do that within schools and take these programs within schools. And so uh, working with teenagers, one word reminders are incredible. Instead of saying, didn't I tell you that? Or saying, you know, every time you do this, I get disappointed, I wish that you would do this and giving them some long-winded answer, just giving them that one word. Um, if you walk in the room and there's a mess and they have, you know, dishes all over the place, dishes. 
and they know what that means and it avoids them getting defensive and that whole like rolling of the eyes because they absolutely do not want to hear your whole long-winded like discussion about whatever it is that they're doing so those one word answers are kind of like that look that we give as as parents um, and they can be very effective in disciplining so we got that and then we'll end with what do children need more than anything ultimately it's love ultimately our children want to feel loved and they want to feel properly that they can communicate that there's consistency that their consequences structure and support but they want to feel love and that what it all comes down to and the way that we express our love is important and there's a book that I recommend. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the love languages. Well, there are the love languages for kids as well. And so it's important to get to know what your children's love language is or what they are because they may have more than one love language and actually loving them in that way so that they feel and receive the love that you have for them. Perfect. All right. I have a question before we go. <clears throat> yes. I'm not sure what category this falls under, but <clears throat> in terms of positive, um, rewarding uh, positive behaviors or just the reward system. I have tried to be very careful about allowing or creating the space where Elle is forming an emotional attachment to foods. So, so in my household, I had decided she has an egg white allergy, which helps tremendously when it comes to cakes and cupcakes and the, the stuff that typically shows up in children's classrooms before uh, now. Um, so that's one thing. But then I also made a decision about no added sugars. She had um, what came naturally in things. But if it was like sugar added, we pumped the brakes on that for a very long time. Uh, here in the last year, with advice from her dentist, she gets to have some things, including ice cream. And I, even when she's being allotted that, based on largely on having had a healthy meal, or days of healthy meals. I just don't want her to end up associating like happiness with like sugar. So, but if you've done all your things, like if you, if she ticked all her boxes, she's like, mommy, I ate on my dinner. Mommy, I made my bed this morning and brushed my teeth. Can I have dessert please? So I want to know how to do that. How to still reward her when she's done her chore wheel, but tamp down this immediate association emotional attachment to food so you said what you so okay thank you for that question and you said what you don't want so i want to start by asking you what do you want what do you want the result to be i just want her to have a healthy relationship to all foods like i i knew that i needed it couldn't have always been no 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 because when she gets out and is able to make her own decisions, now she's eating everything out. So I want her just to have like a healthy thought process and relationship to foods. I, I, I would like that when she's older and out in the world to not be like, <clears throat> I'm sad today. Let me go on and eat this gallon of ice cream. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I would just like for it to not develop an unhealthy attachment to it. And so do you do you feel that you've at some point had an unhealthy relationship with food that she could be modeling in some way or is this her no. own language no okay. i mm -mm. i um i was no is the answer <laughs> okay. yeah so um a couple and i don't know that i could ask you more questions but i i would say a couple of things one the consequences if you're explaining to her what the consequences are so she gets the why behind it like i don't want you to have an unhealthy relationship with food because this is what it results in this is what could happen and helping allowing some space for her to make the choices on her own so yeah i get what you're, that you're saying that when when the reward is the dessert then she gets the excitement about the dessert and that is um, and that's where you think that some of the unhealthy relationship is coming from. Yet, maybe there's an opportunity to reward her with something else for healthier foods. So sure. what if there was a, you know, if she eats this many vegetables or something, that there's a reward for the healthier foods as well, so that she wants that reward so much that she does exploration into looking into what healthier food she can eat and then finds, oh gosh, you know, I'm, no, I really like apples and I didn't know that. Or, you know, um, just uh, giving her asking her to help you and making some of the decisions helps her 
initially with with making her own decisions with your support and that you're not because your rules are going to go away one day right and she'll go to college and there's a bunch of crap food there and so like if you are involving her in the process now uh and and rewarding her in a way that feels right for her and what you want for her then you're giving her you're strengthening that muscle that she'll take on with her wherever she goes okay thank you yeah yeah, I hope that helps. It's 12, it's one uh, thirty-four, and I don't like to keep people past the time that I say that I'll keep them. So this has been a great time to connect with other moms, and I'm so glad that you all joined us. And I really love uh, the opportunity for discussion and doing this in person. So hopefully when we're off quarantine punishment, I can get in with the Mocha moms and we'll do something together like this more interactive and workshop where I can see your lovely faces. Uh, Shawana says, I love this. Thank you. We do this every month. So I just want to let you all know it's the first Monday of every month. We have different topics. Next month, we're talking about uh, mental, how to deal with stress and coping through all of this, not just for ourselves, but for our children as well. Uh, we do always tap, give some tips for kids as well. Uh, and then we have December, we're going to talk about self-care routines and how to come up with your self-care routines to replenish and go into 2021, leaving 2020 behind. So thank you all for joining us. You can find me thank on Instagram. You. Thank you. You can find me at The Flow Coach on Instagram or courtswellnesscollective.com is my website. And I hope to see you all again. Hi, Cam. Hi, Cam. Uh, I love all the kids in the background. I'm going to go play with my baby. Now. <laughs> she was getting in this picture. Right. <laughs> in the house acting like a linebacker for the NFL. <laughs> yes. All right, everybody. Have a great day. You Take too. Care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Shawana.